Today, uh, the table has turned. So for the first time, I'm the guest and not the host of a podcast. Welcome to the Tao of Chow podcast, where we will try to find balance and provide a clearer path forward in this uncertain world. Today, Brian Moore, the host of the Active Advisor podcast, invited me to be his guest. The Active Advisor podcast series explores the dynamic world of investment research and financial advisory practice management. Brian is the head of capital markets at Harbor Capital Advisors. Harbor Capital is a 35-year-old firm that provides access to elite sub-investment managers and products across the globe with over $43 billion in asset under management in 2023. I share my 30 plus year of professional journey in the financial and investment industry with a firm commitment to independence and advocacy for the fiduciary standard. And here's our podcast and hope you will enjoy it. Welcome, Philip, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. I'm looking forward to today's episode. I think we're going to have a really good one. I'm looking for that Philip Chow you were talking about, so I'm a little nervous. (laughs) <laughs> well, we'll see if we can find them together. How about that? Please, please do. Thank you. <laughs> now, before we dive into our conversation, I'd love to hear, in your own words, a little bit more about your practice and what you're focused on today. As you have mentioned already, that we offer discretionary investment and portfolio management services to individuals and families and institutions. So for institutions, we do in two different ways. One is subject to ERISA, which is retirement plan. As you know, Department of Labor imposes very high standards. And also to other institutions who are not subject to ERISA. I know I sound really specific there, but that's very important. It matters. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, from time to time, for whatever reason, people feel that I may know something a little bit more than they do, and they will ask me to consult to help them on their businesses. I'm talking about insurance companies and asset managers who may be interested in a particular angle from an advisor standpoint or from a strategy standpoint. And I will serve sort of a one-off basis, uh, sometimes one or two or three years. But today, as I've always been, is to find, try to find ideas and to solutions that can best meet my clients' needs, right? So we're spending a, a bit more time now with, in private markets and their offerings, because those are kind of hot topics. And we're trying to figure out how best to implement that into a overall portfolio for clients. And so at the end of the day, you know, we believe like everybody else, the diversification is probably the only free lunch in investing. So we believe in diversification and we also have tactical adjustments over time so that we make either some go after more opportunities or to protect clients' portfolio on the downside. That's what we do. We spoke briefly and diversification really is the free lunch, I think. And that's one of the things where being, you know, somebody who's an expert in the field or, or definitely heavily involved in tracking everything, it really kind of gives you an advantage over somebody who's just kind of new to the business or even somebody who's just looking at it up from their own home. I will also tell you, I know that this is another topic, behavioral finance, right? So we talk about it as if we are non-emotional beings and only clients are. I suggest that we are equally as emotional. And part of our job is to check ourselves. Are we making this decision based on emotion or are we making this decision that is the right decision to make. And sometimes it's really hard. So having an investment policy, having guidelines and having, you know, bands, not to exceed those bands, check ourselves as well as check the client. And so I think that's, you know, something that we need to be very cognizant of as we manage client portfolios. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I think this is a heavily, even the markets themselves are heavy, very heavily psychologically attuned, I think, to... I've kind of spent a lot of time myself and we're getting way off topic here, but I don't know. I used to, sometimes I call the markets the biggest experiment and group think that's out there. Yes. And that's why we have super highs and super lows because oopsie, there are too many oopsie moments. And what we're trying to do is cut off those oopsie moments, but it's, it's a lot of work to do that because you're not sure if those are oopsie moments or they're not oopsie moments. (laughs) So I think asset allocation, going back to having an investment policy having clear guidelines and hopefully red lines that were basically nothing more than checking ourselves. Well, that's excellent. (laughs) I'm going to jump right in here to typically what we ask as our first question on the active advisor. Love to get the conversation started by 
What is your first memory that you have related to money or investing? I think the first one, I think it's the first one, is when I was, I think was like eight or nine years old when I was in Hong Kong when I was a kid. And I heard my parents talking about where to park their money with their friends. Now, they're not drug dealers. I don't mean parking money like washing their money. But, you know, they have cash and, you know, they put in savings and they want to know, you know, they were talking among themselves, should it be in Hong Kong dollars, which would be what they will have earned, or is it in U.S. dollars, German Deutschmarks or, or British pounds, that type of thing, or even Swiss francs for that matter, back in the day before EU kind of destroyed all the distant, different currencies. And to get a better return or to have more currency stability. Now, these are words that I'm using now. I didn't understand a thing they were talking about. All I know was U.S. dollars and German or whatever. And so I never thought much about it until decades later, getting into this business, and you move from a tiny little island called Hong Kong into this humongous country called United States. And we are so blessed in this country having two oceans and two friendly neighbors that we have nothing to worry about and that we are robust, you know, a democracy and so on and so forth. And we never have to think about putting our money in somebody else's currency. I mean, that is kind of foreign, right? So in many ways, you learn, well, okay, so we were in a totally different place, totally different time. And not because they are sophisticated, but they are forced to be more adventurous to keep what they have and to eke out some kind of return. Whereas here, we take our peacetime prosperity for granted. That, yeah, of course, you know, but if you start thinking about that, it can be kind of kind of interesting and if we place ourselves in a different place in a different time. It's somebody who traveled recently overseas this summer. You, When you go back overseas, you really do kind of get reminded, as you mentioned, that here in the U.S., we are spoiled in this respect. We kind of, you know, dollars are accepted globally. They're kind of, it's thought of as a kind of reserve currency. Yeah. And the, a lot of the world speaks English just because it's the language of commerce. I hope that we have an opportunity to talk about that later, about the U.S. dollars, which you are absolutely right. My whole life, I don't have to make any exchanges. I just take my dollars and everybody wants it. You know, $100. Okay, great. What is the exchange rate? And give me your local currency back. Everybody accepts it. We just don't even realize how privileged we are. And that's really to do with our soft powers only can rest on hard power. Anyway, that's a different story we can talk about later. <laughs> <laughs> so let's fast forward a little bit from that first memory. In the intro, I read that you started your practice in the early 90s. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background and the career path that led you from those early days to founding Experiential Wealth. I wish I can say that ever since I was two years old, I, I wanted to be a financial advisor or asset manager or, or something like that, which I was not. I have no idea what I wanted to do. So I first entered the financial service industry after college and went into the life insurance business and learned a great deal about how to applying the, you know, the, the right type of financial solutions and products to a particular issue, in this case, death and dying, as an important component for managing risk. So I started my, sort of my career, if you want to call that, back then, even though I didn't know that was my career. It was just one of the jobs that I got, and really about financial security and managing risk. So that was how I started. But I felt that, that all financial challenges can, cannot be solved on life insurance, uh, or annuities for that matter. And of course, life insurance industry will tell you there isn't an issue you cannot solve with life insurance. And I, I know that probably not true, or I, I, at least I haven't found that to be true. So the idea of planning was very much central to the process of saving and investing and really thinking about the future. So planning was very much actually a component to the life insurance industry back then. So I needed to really broaden my knowledge and experience and, you know, and, and the services in order to really help individuals and families to meet their financial objectives. So I wanted to have a, a company, or I wanted to do my own thing, shall we say, that could offer advice and solution that I, I believe are comprehensive and transparent and, you know, really helping folks. And in 2019, I didn't find the, I didn't call my company the current name. I called it Chow and Company, which is kind of, Really creative, as you can tell how creative a person I am. So I used to call it Chow and Company. And come 2019, I said, you know, who is this Chow guy? And why should I go to Chow and Company? It doesn't tell me anything. You know, it could be anything. So I changed the name to Experiential Wealth to better express the mission of, of our firm. Because I believe that accumulating wealth is not an end, but a means to an end, right? The end could be a retirement income, could be a second home, could be college education for grandkids, for setting up family foundation, or to making perpetual gifts for a specific cause. Whatever that turns you on about your 
desire to do whatever you want to do with your money and with your wealth. It is these experiences that we're working hard to attempt to realize for our clients. That, that's what we do. We don't dictate what house you live in. You tell us what house, we help to build it. So we're kind of architects, if you would. Hence, we are now called experiential wealth. Hopefully that makes some sense to you. It does. It does. And I think that was an excellent way to put it. I think you're architects in that respect. Yes. You're really kind of constructing not only where people are now, but also kind of the vision of the future for them. Exactly. Once you get the, you know, the parameters or the specs. Exactly. Exactly. Sorry, my dad was a contractor. That definitely resonated with me. Okay. Yeah, but it's, it's so true. You know, so many people going around building a home that is good for the builder, not so much good for the resident, right? We are not here to build a house and make you live in it. We are here to build a house that you want so you can live in it. It doesn't matter if I like it or not. It's about, is it right for you? And I think that perspective is so important. So we don't believe in fitting everybody in the same house. We believe in building a custom house for you that will meet your lifestyle and your expectation and, and so on. So anyways, using the building analogy a little bit longer. <laughs> and I think that was a great answer because it really kind of follows up you know, my next question, which is, I think if we look back in the financial landscape and when I started in the business, you knew there were independent firms, but they were popping up here and there. It was really kind of more the big wirehouses. And you founded Experiential Wealth over three decades ago. So I've got to ask, how have you seen the independent space change over the years? So first of all, my wife, who is much smarter than me, you should have asked her to be the guest. So I would just say this. She has always said, Philip, you are the worst employee ever. Do not try to find a job. Just go do your own thing. That's what she said to me. And I always remember that's what she said. So for right or wrong reason, independence is what I was looking for. So the expansion of the independent space, I think it's inevitable or was inevitable and still is. So I think of the starting point really is May 1, 1975. That goes way back. I mean, 50% of people listening to this probably wasn't even born in 75. So the era of fixed commission for stock transaction ended. I don't know if everybody knows that. Which basically broke up the oligopoly, or oligopolistic, if I can pronounce it correctly, I still didn't do it right, control of investment sales and, and advice, right? Because the, back then was like, okay, you have to charge this much per trade and for da 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 So it's really protecting the wirehouses. And 75 was the first time, the May Day, and the interesting May Day, that they broke that out. Then again, on October 27th, 1986, the London Stock Exchange, which was at the time was significant and also deregulated and also broke up this whole idea of fixed commission and is known that day is the Big Bang. So we went from May Day to Big Bang. It sounds horrible. And so the deregulation basically also authorized firms to, wow, represent investors. Well, that's a new, new, new concept, right? And, and open the London Stock Exchange, as you know, LSE now is uh, to foreign firms so that people can participate in the spoils of all these commissions or whatever, or lack thereof, and implement an electronic platform. Now, London Stock Exchange, of course, is very big. So is New York Stock Exchange. So it has not only a local feel, but a global feel. So globally, they start thinking about, hey, maybe we don't just have a fixed commission anymore and let competition begin. And that was monumental. I mean, even back then, but we didn't realize how monumental it really became, right? So this brought deregulation and competition globally. Of course, it took time and space and needed for independent delivery of investment sales and advice to take hold, so to speak. And in 1985, the CFP board was formed. Now, CFP board is formed, well, because there's a lot of people looking for what? Financial planning and so on, and they needed an accreditation. They needed to say, gosh, not everybody can just hang a sign without some kind of education about how to help me. And I remember back in the day when, I'm talking about way back in the day, where people say, gosh, I want to do a financial plan. It is about this thick, about three pounds, and nobody read it, and it cost $5,000. That was the old financial plan, meaning everything you ever want to know is all in there, and the day that you got it is already out of date because your situation may have changed. So back then was truly comprehensive financial planning that has every component of financial plan in this, you know, thick document. Then it evolved into single issue planning and so on and so forth. So since then, the advice, advice industry has been substantially replacing the brokerage industry, as you know, as the way to deliver investment and advice. So for years, the wirehouse brokers have been moving to independent channels. 
And for those not really quite ready to abandon commission, then they move into sort of duly licensed independent broker-dealer channel, and other went straight to fee-only approach. There's no right or wrong answer. Everybody have different comfort level. I just chose not to do that. So along the way, the requirement also of fiduciary relationship, which is actually imposed by our RIA, Registered Investment Advisor, there is a relationship called fiduciary relationship that you owe, you sign off, you owe to your client. It is hard-coded in regulation that really what they bought conflict into the sunlight, which is really important in this independent space. So this further push commission-based sort of captive broker arrangement to move to a more like a fee independent advisor model. At least that's how I think of it. So now don't forget asset manager, fintech and custodians all along the way have morphed to support this, right? You can't do it alone. You need everybody else to come in. So they see the writing on the wall. And to support this sort of independent channel with Low fees, which is, as you know, has been a a 20 plus year movement actually since Big Bang. And reliable portfolio management, reporting, and financial planning software, and all those type of things add to enabling people like me to be independent. So today, the average age, I'm afraid to say, is in their late 50s. I mean, people like, like most of the folks that you talk to, advisors, are in their late 50s. And then most of them are looking to do what? The next five to 10 years, say, bye. I'm leaving. You know that since the great financial crisis, which was 8, 9, through COVID, we have a super low, super low interest rate. I mean, zero interest rate. This cheap money has contributed to people buying up these firms because these firm owners are saying, well, you know, I'm, let me leave. I, I need to take some risks off the table. Maybe you can buy me and I'll work for you a few more years and I'm leaving. So that created reconsolidation in this industry. Now, you remember we have Wirehouse, when independent, all these individuals running around, then these individuals now saying, no, 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 I need to get out sooner or later. So this gave rise to aggregators. And aggregators and consolidators will systematically replace wirehouses of the past. And so I think true independents are going to be threatened again. So in a way, the more we change, the more we stay the same. Stay the same. I do like kind of seeing that that vision of what you described, if I can paraphrase it, is really kind of, you know, it was a wirehouse, power wirehouse monopoly. I mean, they held all the cards in the deck. So you started to have the independence. And I think over the years, we've seen the independent channel grow from that's the people down the street to all of a sudden now, I wouldn't say they're the 800 pound gorilla, but they're pretty close. Give them, say, maybe 700. And it's really nice to see that because it allows you know, people like yourself and firms like yours to to really become an architect rather than just having to stay in the pre-described investment planning can solution that I'm not saying all the wirehouse advisors do that, but I guess what I'm trying to say in a, in a play way is really kind of unleash the shackles and let you customize for each client. I hope that we can continue that model. I'm afraid that may be being eroded. As we leave, we are selling back into an aggregator which acts much more like a wirehouse, not by name, but by function, because of compliance, because these are the investments that you're allowed to sell. It's like, well, hold on. Didn't I go to independence to not have this? You know, so conflicts and conflicts and conflicts. I'm not saying every single one. I'm just saying that trend is not continue independence for all the reasons I mentioned, but perhaps stepping back a little bit. And it's up to those individuals who still are fiercely independent, who believe that they have something unique to offer some goodness to offer, then they will stay. But for others who say, well, gee, I just want to let go of some of my risk and I'm done and I'm leaving. So anyways, that's another story for another day. It is. And it's something we could definitely continue to talk about. I guess to sum it up is we need more people in this business who are constantly curious and looking to always, you know, help people out. Exactly. That we're going to shift gears here just a little bit. Would love to hear a little bit more about the institutional advisory services that you provide. And kind of curious, what drew you to those two areas? Is it something that you started when you started in the business, you kind of had an inkling that you wanted to focus on those, or is it just kind of along your journey that those are the two areas that you found that appealed to you most? I think it's the latter. So so during my early insurance career, as I mentioned, I was drawn to what they called, I think they still call advanced underwriting services. Advanced underwriting services required knowledge in estate planning, succession planning, shareholder and ownership planning, you know, buy-sell agreement, funding of that, and incentive compensation planning. 
And those I have always find it interesting because it's much more complex than saying, oh, you're going to die while well, you need some money and let's buy, sell your life insurance policy. And that's not very exciting. It may be very useful, but not very exciting. Rather, we want to spend time helping clients to figure out how to fund for their transition, succession, what happened if they want to get out of the partnership, uh, how do they value the partnership, how do they exit, and where is that funding coming from? You know, all that, it's just enormously exciting. And there isn't a single formula you have to sort of actively listen and understand and then work with their attorneys and their accountants to create solutions for them. So these are areas typically are much more complex. So after moving into the wealth management or wealth planning industry, however you want to call it, those names just keep changing every decade. It's a different name. So I continue to seek out opportunities, right, that I could assist and add value to closely held businesses. And today, we manage portfolios for small institutional clients, such as foundations, social organizations, cemeteries, associations, and nonprofits. I purposely say cemeteries is that you are giving a commitment to your client who's a cemetery, who gave a commitment to the survivors, who gave the ashes to or the body to the cemetery to, to, to take care of for eternity. And that money is given to me to help to ensure that promise is kept. So it's an awesome duty. I don't know if people think of it that way. But it's truly fiduciary. Truly fiduciary. Because they are relying on us to make sure the cemetery is taken care of, the dead is respected, you know, and so on and so forth. And it will go on forever. So when you talk about long-term investing, I cannot think of any place more than a cemetery for long-term <laughs> investing. The time horizon is infinity. Fascinating. Anyways, so over, over 20 years ago, I also identified Defined Contribution Retirement Plan as a practice focus. So I act as a fiduciary advisor, consultant, whatever you want to call me, to each plan sponsor in selecting and monitoring the investments as well as serving as their you know, advocates. In them selecting and monitoring other service providers, like record keepers and so on. So I'm their advocate. My role is only helping the plan sponsor and the committee not crossing over to try to grab individual participants to be my client. I think that's a conflict. So I don't do that. My line is very clear. I'm only helping the plan sponsor. So this is more consulting since I'm not managing the plan, right? So I'm very fortunate that I've been referred to a number of very large plans and enjoyed, you know, serving as their advisor. So hopefully that answered your question. I think it went way beyond your question. <laughs> no, it did. And, and I think you brought up one or two points that I'd love to ask you another question for one. You're a big fan, as, as am I, of the fiduciary standard. I think it's something that whether it's talked about on a frequent basis or whether it's kind of understood in conversations between professionals, it's something that we realize is out there and we all have to strive to live to every day. Would love to hear you know, a little bit more about your passion for the fiduciary standard and why you feel it's critical. Okay, I'm going to give you some examples, maybe using that storytelling. So a fiduciary, first of all, let's make sure we understand what that means. It's a person that you can trust to help you in areas that you have little or insufficient knowledge. And this barrier of knowledge to acquire this knowledge and to maintain it is very high. Otherwise, why do you need help? I mean, if you know how to do all this, you don't need anybody, right? So you intend to, thus you intend to entrust someone with your assets. That's what that fiduciary is supposed to do or play that role. So let me give you an example. So assuming that you're not a physician for a second and that you don't have medical knowledge and you need to seek medical advice and possibly a procedure. So you are going to go look for a doctor who has one certainly competent and experienced, right? Two, keeping up with current medical research and knowledge, and they, they know what they're doing now or what's going on contemporary. And number three, make recommendation that places your interests as the patient ahead of everything else. I think those are basic requirements. I know you don't knock on the door of physicians and say, hold on for a second, are you competent and experienced? Two, are, you know, those are kind of given, understood, and same thing for investment, right? So if you happen to go see an internal medicine doctor who is competent and keeps you keeps up with the current research and he's just, you know, not just interested in making sure that you are treated for whatever the reason you went there, but also he wants to be selling some medication on the side to you. He's, oh, you know, Mr. Patient, uh, you should take some of these pills and our office happened to sell them so that they get paid. 
Would that be okay with you? I hope you say no. And why should you say no? Why is that a problem? That's a problem because you don't know where my loyalty lies. You don't know if this medicine truly is the best or is it best equally good for me. There is no equal. There is no equal. It's either best for you or it is not best for you. The fact that I get paid or not get paid has nothing to do with that decision. Right. So probably not. You probably wouldn't like that kind of a idea of going to a physician. So if you're my client and I charge you an asset base fee of, say, 75 basis point to manage your money. However, I also use proprietary products that my firm packages, where my firm makes more money. And I get kind of like incentive compensation. If I have enough of those, by the end of the year, I will get this, I'll get a trip, I'll do whatever. Would that be okay? No. I would hope you would say no, because not because it's so awful, but you just don't know if I'm protecting you or am I sharing that with myself? So investment advisor plays a critical role in helping clients in managing their assets. Clients rely on me in this case to give them the best advice and management I can do without conflict, right? So the relationship is based on most important word, trust, which is what the word fiduciary is and should never be violated. And this is sacred and we owe that to every client. And I mean every word I said because that is so important. I will tell you, once you cross that line, you are not coming back. There is no coming back from it. Trust is like nothing, no, trust between people. We will, cannot have a relationship if we don't have a foundation of trust. And it takes a long time to build that trust, but take one second to break that trust. Our role is never break that trust. Okay, that's it. Oh, very true, very true. And I, sh I share your same, same passion and, and beliefs. Thank you. Now, you're known for sharing your opinions and writings in different industry news outlets. You write your own quarterly commentaries. I do. And you even have your own podcast. I do. I would want to ask, where, where do you find free time? But with all that said, there's two hot button questions I'd love to ask you and get your opinion on. Sure. In your opinion, fiduciary standard aside, what makes a good advisor? And what do you think are the most important elements that someone should look for when trying to hire? A financial advisor. So we go back to fiduciary, right? So that's number one. If I go get a banker, it's not, does he have fresh and clean $100 bills? It's not, would he buy me a nice dinner? It's, is he an honest broker? Is he an honest banker? Is he going to deliver what he said he would deliver and always do, do it for me? So I think duty or loyalty, which is really one of the two most important criteria, by the way, there are two, duty or loyalty and duty of due care. So let's break that down just briefly. So duty of loyalty is putting your client's interest ahead of anything else and anybody else. So we are here to serve our clients and to help them meet their personal financial or institutional objectives, period, right? We never put our interest the same or ahead of somebody else's. Now, people say, ah, oh, yeah, 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 but don't you get paid? Sure, we get paid. We disclose it. We agree that I get paid to provide the service, but that's it. That's not a conflict. I mean... If I say I would do it for free, you're going to question, really? Are you really doing it for free? Where are you getting paid? So that's duty of loyalty. I mean, we can spend actually a lot of time on duty of loyalty. That is truly important. But I will also say that loyalty alone is not enough. I mean, a dog is very loyal. There is no other animal that I know of, a domesticated animal, that's more loyal than a dog. I could hit the dog tomorrow. He's still excited seeing me when I walk through the door. I mean, that's loyalty. But I wouldn't ask my dog to help me plan for my finances. Why? Because he lacks the duty of due care. So what is duty of due care? It's deliver the highest standard of care, which is not just a, again, beautiful office, a nice dinner, slick presentation, or brochures. We are not asset gatherers, and I know you and I talked about that before. We are here to provide an important service. And in order to provide that service, we got to be very good at what we do and constant student, which I know you are one. So some of the traits that I think about in finding an advisor is, one, the recognition and the disclosure of biases. You know, I come to you, how is it different than anybody else? The first question you should ask me, tell me your preferences and biases. Well, what do you mean? Well, don't you have any biases? Let's hear what he or she has to say, right? I'm talking about reinvestment related or personal. Re you need to know who this person is. Now, I want to, right up front, when you're looking for an advisor, you're not buying a friend. You're not going out there dating. You're going out there to find somebody who you can entrust 
your life savings to. Don't you want to get to know that person? Yes, but not as a friend, but to scrutinize, is this a person worthy of being hired? Number two, ability to balance between super calm. There are people coming, yeah, yeah, I know everything. Yeah, there's nothing I don't know. Blah, 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 blah. And humility. Because there is no one knows everything. So can you find that balance between confidence is what you need. You want that person to be confident. But not so confident that had lost sight of humility because that's reality. So I think that component is important. Making effort to improve constantly himself or herself through professional education, not just certification. There are people who have so many certifications, they need a you know, fold-out card. That doesn't mean anything. Yes, it means something, but not sufficient to impress on me that this is a person who envy, who should be envied for his thirst for education. It's just that he's really good in taking exams. Number four, demonstrates a sense of curiosity and comfortable to be challenged. Because the relationship you're going to have is saying, thank you, telling me this, but why do you say that? There are people who get offended. You're challenging them. Hold on for a second. It's my money, right? So curiosity and comfortability about being challenged. And then the ability to communicate in layman terms. I've heard so many women who says, when a male advisor comes in, they use these big words and look down at us as if we don't exist and uh, we don't understand what he says. We just sit there like, no, that's not acceptable. Raise your hand. Howl on the desk. Hold on. Who are you trying to impress? I'm not impressed. There's a famous philosophy in China way back that says, if you cannot make a three-year-old understand what you said, it's too complicated. You should be able to make everything easy to understand. So again, the ability to communicate. Another one is show the patience to guide, and to advise, and to educate. Patience, right? If he does, he or she doesn't have the patience, then he's the wrong. Because you're not looking for just a quarterly performance. You are looking for somebody who can take care of your financial well-being. And finally, illustrate how new or contrarian information is included and absorbed in the planning process because things are happening always all the time. So those are sort of my, if I'm to ask somebody, what are the traits that you should be? Those are the, some of the traits and not all the traits, but to me, those are important traits. I think that's a complete list of my terms or my <laughs> There's designation that gives you those seven traits. No, no, there's not. <laughs> No, there's not. But I think you really did touch on all the facets of what makes a good, not only a good person, an inquisitive friend, you know, mentor, but also a good advisor. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Love to hear your take on the next American Renaissance. <laughs> How much time? Do we exactly. Have? And I feel we could. I feel we could talk for hours about this, and I would love to have you back on to have this conversation because. <laughs> I share a lot of your views and, and, and your thoughts on this. And I think it's really something that is going to shape the markets for the next 10 years plus. Okay. So as you know, I wrote about this first quarter this year, every quarter I write a thing. And the first quarter I wrote about this very, very topic. And the last quarter I wrote about the two Americas, which we won't get into during this conversation. But this is part of, this contribute potentially to two Americas and in fact, the election today is really talking about the two Americas in some ways. But, okay. All right. So the Inflation Reduction Act, as you know, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act and the CHIPS Act together have about $2 trillion worth of fiscal spending. I mean, this is the Trump and Biden during COVID. And much of this is really down payment. And so the private companies, domestic and foreign, and state and local government will make up the remaining amount. So they have come in with two trillion. We think that it's going to be something like twenty to thirty trillion all in over the next five ten years, which is an enormous amount of enormous amount of money. So this is also supported by the new American industrial policy, right? The new American industrial policy, which is bringing it, manufacturing back onshore, or nearshoring, or friendshoring. This is all part and parcel to that, especially in advanced manufacturing which is chips and technology. I remember, I think Biden administration said that we do not make any chips at all today. We are going to be responsible for 40% of the world's chip production. From zero to 40, right? 
So that's significant commitment. We get there or not, it's almost irrelevant, but that's the policy. So in the foreseeable future, in the next administration, let's not significantly alter this, or diminish the, these efforts. And I say that with some amount of confidence. I'll tell you why in a moment. So American exceptionalism will be extended. And we will likely enjoy the next American renaissance, which is directly answering, hopefully, your question. But this fiscal-driven response is laced with protectionism through persistent use of tariff as a weapon. Shrinking cross-border trade as a weapon. And beginning more self-reliant. And although we are closing in, we are more internal today than external. We have always been kind of uncomfortable as a country going out. I mean, if you look at even Second World War, in the First World War, we were really hesitant. We don't want to. We're really happy where we are. Actually, we are happy where we are. We don't need, as I mentioned earlier, we're two wonderful oceans and two countries that are my friends, our friends. What am I going to worry about? Why am I going all over the world trying to figure all these things out? So America has always been a bit of a reluctant player in the global stage until the fall of USSR, and we became the only hegemon in the world. So we're becoming more self-reliant, or we're trying to become more self-reliant and have, have shown dire consequences smooth Harley back in uh, a century and a half ago that ended in depression and so on. Most of the time, extended closeness has not end well. I don't know if this is going to be extended or not, but it has not in the past. So moreover, the U.S. public debt is also unsustainable and will one day reach its natural limits. Now, I don't know if you know this, for the first time, our debt payment, in other words, the interest on debt payment that we owe to the public has crossed over even more than defense budget. That's huge. So also, so, so the debt-driven economy growth will push up, what, inflation, of course, which will keep, what, interest rate high for much longer. This will do what? will cost us even more to service the debt than we can afford in the first place. So there are some other issues here. Yeah, Renaissance, yes, but at what price and is it sustainable? So the great power competition, which is where I want to go also, where I think that doesn't matter who is in administration next four years, because of our great competition with, with China, great power competition, we're going to continue this route because we do not want anybody else to go ahead of us, militarily, commercially, in any way. So we'll continue as U.S. intends to ring fence China militarily and contain its rise. So depending on the U.S. domestic and foreign policy and sensibilities, <laughs> and one, how the U.S. uses its soft and hard power, which I mentioned earlier, two, weaponization of the dollar system, three, the limitless way of using sanctions, which is a real problem. So you've prolonged, and already if it goes on, are forcing the global south, which is, you know, doesn't have to be south, but, you know, what we used to call emerging markets, BRICS countries, to look for alternative routes away from the post-World War II international system, which we are very proud of, which we are the kingpin on. It is already happening in oil trades and other goods among non-advanced economies where they settle in other currencies, which is part of what we call de-dollarization, not to be confused with getting rid of reserve currency. That's not what I'm talking about. It's the number of trades settled in U.S. dollars. Why is that significant? The more it, it used dollars, the more power we have with our dollar. The less people use dollars, the less power we have with our dollar. Right? That just makes sense. So those are some of the issues. And further, that we, the U.S. will lead, fracturing, will lead the fracturing of, the, of fragmenting the global trade system. Right? into regionalization, which is where we're going, right? Oh, I only want to deal with my buddies or people who look like me and talk like me. I don't want to go there. And those guys will only deal with people who talk like them or belong to a certain religious sect or what. doesn't matter. This is a fracture, right? So we are going to continue to nationalistically nationalizing the tariff by putting unconstrained tariff almost. It can hurt the very system the U.S., have expected the rest of the world to follow, to support. I mean, we are to always talk about the liberal world order. That's part of the liberal world order. But we're helping to erode the veracity of, of that order. So there will be an added friction to the U.S. maintaining supremacy or hegemony and shortcut its renaissance or exceptionalism if we just overreach, overextend 
our world power. So I don't want to end in the negative, but it's not all positive. So we can be exceptional, and we have been, and we are. The renaissance of an industrial policy will help us, but there are unintended consequences. So we need to check ourselves. And I think sometimes we have stopped checking ourselves. And those consequences that we're not really thinking through, and we just want to do it now out of whatever reason. So that's my short portion of the answer. And an excellent one. And one that, you know, we'll have to unpack further. <laughs> okay. I have several questions myself and several things I'd love to get your opinion on. But with that said, I don't want to monopolize your day. And I have one final question. Sure. At Harbor, we're firm believers in active management. Though it is important to acknowledge that every financial expert has their own unique perspective. From your experience, what is your take on active management and where have you seen it making the most significant difference? So for anybody in my shoe to say, I don't believe in active management it is not really being reflective. The fact that I'm a portfolio constructor, I'm an active manager right away, right? I mean, otherwise just use a model and the model never changes. There's no active. The fact that I'm involved in the day-to-day, -day, quarter to quarter, I'm active. So number one, I believe in active management. So to use active management is to what? To look for a higher absolute return, maybe? Or preferably a, a better or superior risk-adjusted return, perhaps? As compared to what? A passive index or index-based portfolio, right? I mean, that's what we're supposed to do. And what we think that we can do better, and that's why active management exists. So in a However, in an efficient market, such as, you know, it's like U.S. large cap S&P 500, the ability to consistently outperform the active management is very, very rare and difficult. Because in order to do that, we have, have to abandon rational thought. Because the tree is going to grow all the way to the sky every five years, and we know it doesn't. So during those times where we are cautious, the market continues to go up, we underperform. And SEF active management is not right, or we just don't, we can't outperform. There's a reason why I don't outperform is because we don't believe it goes to the sky. For example, just a simple idea. So, but in less efficient market where information is less available and we can arbitrage information for one reason or another, such as private market or small cap or emerging market or fixed income, active management have demonstrated over and over it can add value with the right manager. Not every manager is right. So, we just want to be careful. The high fees could eat away some of the returns, right? I know you guys are very conscious about fees. And sectors and specialty funds also tend to favor active management. And fixed income had also proven to deliver significant value in active management. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, that was a lot of fun with Brian. Um, and I really appreciated him. And of course, uh, the Harbor Capital Advisor for spending time with me and trying to learn about my thoughts. And I can just imagine continuing that conversation for another hour or two, of course. So perhaps we will um, do another one where we can continue uh, where we left off. Thank you. You can always find more episodes by visiting philipchow.us slash podcast or find us on your favorite podcast app. You can always leave us feedback, ask questions, or request a topic for us to discuss by sending an email to pc at philipchow.us. Views expressed in the Tao of Chow podcast are individual opinions, and they do not represent the employers of each guest or the firm each guest is associated. Our podcasts are for educational and informational purposes only and should not be deemed or viewed as investment advice or recommendations. Please consult your personal financial advisor, investment expert, or investment fiduciary before taking any actions about your plan and investments.